Hey guys, what's going on? Good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Hockey on the Spot. Brandon Barenfeld. I'm Brandon Barenfeld. Thank you for joining me today. This is episode 120 of Hockey on the Spot. And before we get into the main point of this video today, just want to go over a couple quick updates from around the league. For example, um, uh, the other day, the New Jersey Devils officially re-signed uh, 41-year-old Yarmir Yager to a one-year deal. Um, Yager was, without question, their best player last year, and they are very confident in his ability to do it again, um, to have maybe just as good, if not better, a better season. Um, you know, he did everything and more for them. He did everything they could ask, and it's amazing how he can still con control the puck, and it's so hard to, for people to knock him off it um, at his age, his day and age. Um, other updates, the New York Islanders have officially acquired the rights to pending unrestricted free agent goaltender Yaroslav Halak from the Washington Capitals in exchange for a 2014 fourth round pick. Um, if the Islanders do not re-sign Halak, then they will get that fourth round pick back. But the Islanders need a goaltender. Um, if getting a Bakov is not getting any younger, and there's, <clears throat> pretty, he's pretty much not going to be back. So um, this is a good move by the Islanders. If of course they could sign Halak, they're hoping they can. Um, but Halak is a guy who really needs to prove himself. Um, he's not the best goaltender in the league, but he's solid, solid enough to be a starter. But it's I don't think he's ever going to bring him a cup. I still think the Islanders would have a great would should draft a goaltender in this upcoming draft, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, um, but when he's on his game, very athletic. Um, um, also, other news revolving the Washington Washington Capitals um, is that uh, veteran defenseman Tom Pody has officially announced his retirement after 14 NHL seasons. So good luck to Tom Pody wherever he goes. <laughs> the Vancouver Canucks have officially fired head coach John Tortorella and assistant coach Mike Sullivan. They recently got a new GM and president in former captain Trevor Linden um, <clears throat> after Mike Gillis was let go or had stepped down. So... Uh, cha much change is needed in Vancouver, so we'll see what happens. It's going to be a very interesting season upcoming for the Islanders, the Capitals, and the Canucks all equally. Um, who's going to be the next head coach for the Canucks? We will see. And that's all the updates for today. Um, th that's all the updates for today. Now let's get into the main point of this video. The first round of the playoffs has officially come to an end, and the second round is about to begin tonight. Um, there were three Game 7s last night um, after the New York Rangers lost Game 6, 5-2 to, to the Philadelphia Flyers on Tuesday. They headed back to Madison Square Garden um, to play the second of a back-to-back -back scenario to play Game 7. There were three Game 7s last night, the New York Rangers and the Philadelphia Flyers at the Garden, um, the Minnesota Wild and the Colorado Avalanche at Pepsi Center, and the Los Angeles Kings and the San Jose Sharks at the Shark Tank. Um, and let, we're, I'm going to bring you the updates of each and every one of those series, who won and why each team won and lo lost. First off, the New York Rangers and the Philadelphia Flyers. The Rangers coming up big on home ice, winning Game 7 by a final score of 2-1. to one. They advance to the next round where they will take on the Pittsburgh Penguins. Congratulations to the New York Rangers. Um, Benoit Pouillot scores the game-winning goal and series-winning goal. Um, as we take a look at an overview of the series, um... Take a look at an overview of the series. Um, the, the pretty much a back a seesaw series. Um, there was no winning streaks in this series. 
The first game, again, the Rangers had home ice advantage in this series. In the first game, dominated by the Rangers. They beat the Flyers by a final score of 4-1. to one, But the Flyers had the first goal in that game. <laughs> um, the second game... The Rangers would hold a 2-0 lead on home ice, but the Flyers would finally end their long losing streak at Madison Square Garden and come back and win 4-2. Then, in game number three, the Rangers would come out on top, up stealing a game in Philadelphia, 4-1 being the final score. Um, so, congratulations to the Rangers on that. And that steal in Philadelphia was a big reason why the Rangers won this series. Um, the, the Flyers stole one at the Garden. The Rangers knew they had to steal one in Philly. Then, game four in Philly, Rangers get the first goal, but it's the Flyers who come back on top with a 2-1 to one victory after the captain, Claude Giroux, guaranteed victory in game four on home ice. Then, game five at the Garden, it would be the Rangers once again who jumped to a 3 nothing lead, almost blew it, and the Flyers came back to make it 3-2. But ultimately, Brian Boyle would seal the deal with an empty netter, and the Rangers would win by a final score of 4-2, giving themselves a stranglehold on the series. The Flyers managed to stay alive in Game 6 on Tuesday at home ice off a big performance by by, struck by forward Wayne Simmons, who would score his first NHL playoff hat-trick and just the second hat-trick overall in the playoffs. Evgeny Malkin had the other one against Columbus in Game 6. But a huge performance by Wayne Simmons. Um, Rangers tried to make a push in the third period, and it wasn't enough. The Flyers would win by a final score of 5-2, to two, although the Rangers, of course, got those two goals at the end of the game. As a po as a motivator for a game seven to to give themselves momentum in game seven and boy did it ever after a scoreless first period the Rangers punt countered with two goals in the second period by Dan Carcillo and Benoit Pouliot Carcillo was reinserted into the lineup <laughs> over J T Miller then in the third period the rookie Jason Ackerson would score his second goal of the playoffs. Um, to make it 2-1, to one, that would be the final score. Henrik Lundqvist stood on his head at the end of the game. And the final score in Game 7, 2-1 to one, Rangers. They move on to the next round to play the Pittsburgh Penguins. Congratulations to the New York Rangers. Now, why the, Philadelphia, why the New York Rangers won and why the Philadelphia Flyers lost? Pretty plain and simple why the Rangers won. As uh, For the most part of this series, they were disciplined. They, they, stayed, they managed to stay out of the box a lot in the series, and as dirty as the series was, in more, more cases than none, the Rangers were able to maintain their composure when the Philadelphia Flyers tried to get under their skin. That was a key factor in that series. And even though the Rangers' power play was pretty much ineffective after the first couple games, it was very ineffective in this series overall, um, the fact that the Flyers continued to take penalties in this series was really what won it for the Rangers. Um, so, congrats. So, the Rangers were able to win this series off of discipline. Also, their strong defensive play in the games that they won. Um, in the games that they won, they were very strong defensively. Um, Dan Girardi had a monster series. He didn't play very well in game number six, but he had a monster series. where They had Ryan McDonough back for the series, and that did help them a bit, although he was a player looking out of place, trying to get back into the lineup and get off and sh shake off the injury. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, those two played very well. And how about that monstrous performance in Game 7 by Anton Strauman? In Game 7, he may have been the best Ranger defenseman on the ice and probably the best defenseman overall. Anton Strauman had a monstrous game in Game 7 for the Rangers and was one of the reasons why they won that series. Strauman came up huge when he had to. And not to mention the Rangers' all-around depth and their 
ability to get scoring contributions from players all over the lineup. Uh, Dominic Moore was one guy who really stood out. He is another guy who may have been the best Ranger in that series next to Marty San Luis. And that's another reason the Rangers won as well. Marty San Luis finally stepping up his game and finally finding his groove in New York at the right time. Um, even though Rick Nash was held off the score sheet, um, Marty San Luis was able to pick up the slack. And those two, Marty San Luis and Rick Nash, along with Derek Stepan, that line has developed some great chemistry. San Luis developed chemistry with those two. And it's going to be interesting to see where Chris Kreider is going to fit now when he gets back into the lineup. Normally he plays on that line, but San Luis played so well on that line you got to figure that he's probably he may just stay on that line and Kreider may go play somewhere else. Um, and I think they, probably another real reason why the Rangers won that series, the former flyer Dan Carcillo making the most of the opportunities that he got. Games 3, 4, and 7, two of those games he scored goals, including last night. So big series for Dan Carcillo. He really he got under the skin of the Flyers. He provided energy, and this is a player who the Rangers should not be scratching from their lineup. They should be playing him every chance they get. He has been so good in this here in these playoffs. Um, you know, and for the Rangers to even think about scratching him at this point, considering his playoff experience, you know, that would be a bad decision for the Rangers to make at this point on. Um, not to mention, not to mention the Rangers do have some veterans in their lineup. We mentioned Dan Carcillo has been in the finals twice, has a cup um, with the Chicago Blackhawks, that 2013 team, um, the 2013 team. I believe he has his name engraved on the cup. He was part of the Flyers team in 2010 that made the finals um, and was a regular in that lineup, a fan favorite. Um, so his experience was brought to the team. Brad Richards, a guy with cup experience with the Tampa Bay Lightning in 04, Conn Smythe Trophy winner. Marty San Luis as well, also part of that Lightning team. Um, so... You talk, look at the look at the cup experience with the of the Rangers compared to the cup experience of the Flyers. <laughs> yeah, compared to the cup experience of the Flyers, um, really for the Flyers, Vinny LeCavalier was also a part of that 04 Lightning team. He's got a cup. Um, you know, and they have also in goal. They got Ray Emery as their backup goalie. He's got a cup and is also two-time finalist. And then Hal Gill, even though he only played, didn't play well. He's another guy who has a cup. He was part of that '09 Pittsburgh team, but as well as the team in '08. But he's not no longer that good. He's not going to really provide anything good. The one game he got to play, he was the worst player on the ice. So. So the cup experience is pretty much about even, but I think the Flyers overall were a little bit of a younger team than the Rangers, and that's why, you know, that's also kind of why the Flyers lost. We talked about why the Rangers won. Now we're on to the Flyers and why they lost. Um, again, with the exception of Game 2, their inability to win on Garden Ice. The Madison Square Garden has just been an absolute house of horrors for the Philadelphia Flyers. And it continues to show. Um, the Flyers, they stole one in Game 2, but the Rangers just managed to steal one right back in Game 3 in Philly, a place that the Rangers struggled all season long. Um, so that was a big reason. Um, the discipline factor I've mentioned earlier, the Flyers in this series just could not stay out of the box. Um, they just could not stay out of the box. Um, the Game 7 wasn't that tight of a game. There weren't that many calls. But Game 1 in particular, the Flyers just let the Rangers get to them. They And even though, the again, even though the Flyers' penalty killing was very good, the Rangers' power play got nothing done. But when you take that many penalties, you lose momentum. And that's what the Flyers did do. Every time they took a penalty, 
there was more momentum lost, except, of course, for Game 6. Game 6 was probably the Flyers' best game of that whole series. Um, they were determined to stay alive and send, the ga send it to Game 7. Um, so that's pretty much why the Flyers lost. That's the biggest reason. Um, oh, yeah, and, of course, not to mention... An overall ineffective series for their captain and star player, Claude Giroux. Um, Giroux obviously got a goal in Game 5, as well as an empty netter in Game 6. <coughs> but um, overall, he was shut down for most of that series. Um, he came up big when he guaranteed that the Flyers would win Game 4. His guarantee came true. But the guarantee could not be completed with the series win. Um, it just kind of shows that no captain will ever be like the great Marc Messier. Um, but for Giroux, um, it was a good attempt, and it got them a win, of course. It got them to motivate them. It motivated them to a seventh game. But for the Flyers, you know, Giroux, other than that, really just did not have a good series. He was shut down. Again, he had two, only two goals, only one of the, but, but one of them was an empty netter. So it was a very ineffective series for Claude Giroux as the Rangers shut him down and did a great job of shutting him down. Um, and the guys who they rely on to get under the skin of players, Scott Hartnell and Wayne Simmons, they at times went a little too far. And, uh, and between the two of them, Hartnell didn't really have that great of a series. He was quiet for most of the series. Simmons, of course, was quiet except for Game 6. Game 6, of course, he had the hat trick. So, um, give a lot of, again, the, it was a good effort by the Flyers overall, but <laughs> the, they just, the, the Rangers' defensive style of play and the fact that the Flyers let it get to them just was not, was just did not provide for a good series for the Flyers. <laughs> now, what does this mean for the Flyers this offseason? Well, <laughs> They don't have too much to think about as far as their free agents. They have a couple of <laughs> decent free agent names. Steve Downey is an unrestricted free agent. Um, I don't see them signing him back. He did not play one game in the Stanley Cup playoffs this year. Um, you know, Adam Hall, he was a big part of the Flyers in this series. And he's really been a big part of the Flyers since really coming over. Um, he's a good uh, defensive forward and he provides them energy. So I could see them maybe bringing him back to a small deal, um, or they let him go if they feel, you know, that they have some youngsters that they're ready to allow step up. Matt Reed is probably the big free agent name for the Philadelphia Flyers. He's an unrestricted free agent, um, and he does a little bit of everything for them. He shoots, he shoots the puck well, and he also is a big, huge part of their penalty kill. He's a sniper slash defensive forward, and he also works really hard. So that would be a big loss for the Flyers, in my opinion. To me, Matt Reed needs to be re-signed. He's 27 years of age, so he's in his prime. Um, in my opinion, Matt Reed needs to be re-signed. So we'll see. It's going to be interesting to see if he stays or if he goes. I think they will re-sign him, but he would be a good addition to any team that could use that type of a player. Um, <coughs> on defense, they have a couple of unrestricted free agents in Kimo Timonen and Hal Gill. And it says Andrew McDonald here as well. However, Andrew McDonald was already re-signed. The Flyers managed to sign McDonald to a six-year contract extension, so he'll be in Philly for a little while. Um, he will be in Philly for a little while. He was... The Flyers trade deadline acquisition from the New York Islanders are close to the trade deadline. But as far as these two, Hal Gill and Kimo Timonen, Hal Gill only played six games during the regular season and one game during the playoffs. He was not effective in any game. Besides, he's 38 years of age, no longer that good. He's probably going to go on to retire. And Kimo Timonen, he's also 38 years old. And this is the sense that this was Timonen's last season also. Um, that, that, that was a sense that a lot of people were feeling. Um, so I don't think Kimo Timonen's coming back. Um, even if he does play another year in the NHL, it probably won't be with the Flyers. Um, he could possibly have one more year left in him, but I think he may want to leave Philly. I think the time has come. 
um, because the Flyers, they're getting younger. They want to move on. So um, Kimo Timonen, I don't think, is in their playing cards right now. And then you look at their goaltending, Ray Emery, an unrestricted free agent. Does he return to the Philadelphia Flyers? Um, does he return to be the backup goaltender? He's a very solid backup goaltender. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, what the Flyers do with him. Um, it will be very interesting to see what the Flyers do with him. So, um, and then, you know, they have some other free agent names in their system as well. Chris Vandeveld, Chris Newberry, um, Bruno Gervais, who's been in their system a bit, Ben Holmstrom, um, Jan, Denny, Jan Danny. Um, so those are, those are some names that have played in the NHL before. Um, so we'll see what happens with some of those guys. Um, and then as far as their restricted free agents are concerned, one's got to feel that most of these guys, if not all of them, will get signed. Braden Shen is a restricted free agent. There's no doubt in my mind that he's going to get signed. He is one of their top six forwards, and he's a very good player. He's one of their better players, um, one of their better snipers. They need to sign him. Time again, an upcoming player. He's going to be good for them. Jason Ackerson, he showed in the playoffs. He's ready to, to play in the NHL. You could bet on it that the Flyers are going to sign him. He's going to be a very good player. On defense, they got Eric Gustafson. He, sh he made himself known in Game 6. He got a goal, and he's got great speed on the blue line. you got to feel that he may be ready to step up and play on the team full-time. He's going to be a solid two-way defenseman for years to come. Um, and then, you know, in goal, they got the youngster Calvin Heater. Um, he's a restricted free agent. They'll probably sign him. He's a guy who they've been looking at and have hopes for. And if Ray Emery doesn't return, he'll probably take his place as the backup to Steve Mason, um, who was, of course, signed to a contract extension. Um, of course, down in the system, they got Mark Andre Bourdon down there. He's played in the NHL a bit. Um, you know, they they got they got a couple of different guys down there. Um, Brandon Manning. No, no one real other than those guys though. No one really big, so won't really say talk about more than I have to. But with that being said, it's going to be an interesting off season for the Flyers again. Matt Reed is probably going to be the most interesting story for the Flyers. We'll see if he stays in Philly or goes tries his luck elsewhere. <laughs> but again, congratulations to the New York Rangers on a huge series win. Next, next, let's talk about our next seven-game series, the Minnesota Wild and the Colorado Avalanche. Give a lot of credit to the Colorado Avalanche. They held a 3-2 series lead. Unfortunately, though, they blew it. The Minnesota Wild come back to win game six, and then game seven in Colorado, they're down by one goal. Jared Spurgeon scores the game, tying goal, and then in overtime, Nino Niederreiter gets his second of the game and his second of the playoffs. That is the overtime winner, just five minutes and two seconds into the first overtime. The, the Wild go on to defeat the Avalanche in seven games by a final game seven final score, five to four in overtime. Um, as we take a look at the series overall, um, and it actually started off great for the Colorado Avalanche. They won game one by a final score of 5-4 to four in overtime. Also, that was an overtime game. Paul Stastny got the overtime winner um, just 7 minutes and 27 seconds into that game. Um, game two, Avalanche win by a final score of 4-2. to two. So they take a 2 nothing series lead. But after that, it was pretty much all Minnesota. Um, um, game three in Minnesota, a highlight reel goal by Michael Granlin, um, wins it for the Wild, one nothing in overtime. Uh, it was an absolute highlight reel, eel in that game, and then the Wild would tie up the series in game number four with a two to one victory in regulation. Game five in Colorado, 
Um, another overtime game, which would go to the Avalanche. Nathan McKinnon would score the overtime winner three minutes and 27 seconds into the first overtime. So, Nathan McKinnon, how about him? He had an absolutely monstrous series in his first ever playoff series in his rookie season. So, give a lot of credit to Nathan McKinnon. He had a monster series. Um, he was probably the best overall player in this whole first round, in my personal opinion. Game six, not even close. The wild, the first, really the first blowout of that of the series and only blowout of the series with the Wild <laughs> shut the door on the Az with a four with a five to two victory um, at home to stay alive and then game seven as I said um, five four the final in overtime Nino Niederreiter scoring the overtime winner he had two goals in the game um, that was in Colorado so why the Minnesota so why the Minnesota Wild won this series? Well, the fact that they kept the Colorado Avalanche without a road victory and then managed to steal one on the road at long last. They've been a terrible road team all year, but they have a lot more experience on their team than the Wild do. Um, the only bad news for the Wild in Game 7, though, they lost Darcy Kemper in the game, and Ilya Brzgalov was called in to play, <laughs> take his place. Um, Brzgalov only faced one shot. He made a save on it, but he gets the credit for the win, um, Ilya Brzgalov. Um, but as far as the cup experience goes, you look at these teams. You look at these two teams. Um... As for the for the uh, for the Minnesota Wild, excuse me, for the Colorado Avalanche, they only have one guy on this whole team with any kind of cup experience at all. Well, two if you count the backup goaltender John Sebastian Jaguar. He of course, but he did not play in the playoffs. But but as far as forwards and defensemen, Maxime Talbot, the only guy on this team with any kind of playoff experience at all, being in the finals twice and winning the cup once. Um, they did. The Avs did not have John Mitchell for game number seven. Um, they didn't have Tyson Berry for most of the series. Um, you know, Corey Sarich was out, and then another guy on their team with Cup experience, Alex Tangay, had been out all season. So um, the loss of Alex Tangay, you know, pretty much killed them for the playoffs. Where you look, whereas you look at the Wild and that their experience. Um, Zach Parise, he's been to the finals once. Danny Heatley's been to the finals once. Um, you know, Brzgo Ilya Brzgalov has a cup. Matt Cook, even though he's not in the lineup, he, of course, had that suspension. He has a cup um, on his resume. So um, I think as far as cups go, Cups probably go to the Avalanche, but as far as the experience that was present in each lineup, um, the Wild are probably a little bit more experienced. The Avalanche still a very young team, and it's, it was their first playoff appearance in years, whereas the Wild were in the playoffs last year. So that was a big factor. And then another big thing was the persistence factor, the persistence of the Minnesota Wild, their hard work, ethic, um, their ability to get to the net. They pretty much closed the gap on the Avalanche in that, that series, and they made life hard for the goaltender, Simeon Varlamov. Um, they made life hard for the Avalanche. And so the Wild fought the whole series. The, the, for the Wild, their worst game of the series was Game 2, and so after that game, they just totally rebounded and were a totally different team. Um, they were just a totally different team. team. And again, though they lost Matt Cook for the rest of the series, um, they still had other key pieces in the lineup like Zach Parise, Miko Koivu, Jason Pominville, Matt Molson. You know, <clears throat> key guys who are proven scorers in the league. So, you know, the Wild... They were built. They were built, and they, of course, were motivated. They had not won a playoff series since the first time that they ever made the playoffs. The first time they made the playoffs, 2003, 
was the only time they had ever won playoff series. They won. They went all the way to the Western Conference Finals and lost in a sweep to the Mighty Ducks that year. But since then, when they would go to the playoffs, they would not. They ha- would not win series. They would always get eliminated in the first round. Though they weren't in the playoffs that much since then. Still, this is the third f- series win in franchise history. Um, their second against the Avalanche. Um, so congratulations to the Minnesota Wild. They go on to the fu- next round where they will look for a rematch. Where they will where they seek a rematch with the defending Stanley Cup champions, the Chicago Blackhawks. Those two teams met each other in the first round last year. The Hawks took that series in five games. So a rematch. Um, the Wild, they feel that they have a much more experienced team than last year, and they feel that they possibly have the tools to beat the Blackhawks. We will see. It'll be interesting. Now, why the Avalanche lost the series... Pretty simple, pretty much the opposite. They couldn't get a win on the road. They could not get a win on the road, and that's what killed them. They knew that the Wild had the ability to steal one in their home ice. The Avalanche knew that they had to steal one in Minnesota to win the series. That's something that they were unable to do. (laughs) The fact, their age. The Avalanche, a very young team, and Patrick Waugh, a young coach. So, first-year coach, um... So, you know, normally that's not going to win you a playoff series right away. Very rare when that happens. But then, and then, of course, probably the big reason that re- all, that stood out in my mind is that they lost Tyson Barry for the remainder of the series with uh, that hit from Matt Cook. The loss of Tyson Barry on defense proved to be a pivotal hole that the, that the Avalanche could not fill. Um... Now you just gotta hope that. Um, now you just gotta hope that Tyson Barry's able to come back next season as strong as ever. But we'll see. It's gonna be very interesting. Gonna be very interesting to see what happens now with um, with um, Tyson Barry. Hopefully he can get back healthy. Um, a lot of a lot of credit. A lot of kudos go out to him. Um, so, oh, and I actually just want to rewind for a minute, too, going back to the Flyers for a minute. I just thought of another reason why they lost the series. They, of course, were without Steve Mason for the first three games of the series, and Ray Emery didn't play that particularly great. You know, you got to think that maybe if they had Steve Mason for the whole series, then maybe, just maybe, the Flyers may have won the series because he was absolutely phenomenal. Um, but Mason, even when he came back, was playing through a concussion, um, was playing through headaches. He wasn't. He was playing through some so, some sort of injuries. Um, so that really hurt him. That that really hurt him. Um, he was concussed and dealing with headaches in the series. But that's 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 it for the Flyers. Um, going back to the Avalanche now. Again, it was just a bad, it was just a tough series for the Avalanche, and it really hurt them. You know, the, the, with the way the Wild played, they totally outplayed them, and the Avalanche know it. But, you know, it's not something that they're going to be completely disappointed about. Despite being second place in the West, you know, when you get back in the playoffs for the first time for in a long time, you know you're probably not going to win. Um, it's it's very rare that that happens. The first your first time back, you win in round one. Um, whereas the Wild were in it last year. But you know what? I'm sure the Aval- all you Avalanche fans out there can agree with me on this. Agree with me when I say this was n- this was nowhere near a disappointment for the Avalanche. You got to give them so much credit to go all the way from sla- from second to last place in the entire National Hockey League and last place in the Western Conference from last season all the way to second place in the West, first place in the Central Division, and third place in the league overall. That is com- that is something completely amazing, and that doesn't happen often. And a lot of credit goes to the great drafting of Joe Sackick 
and hit, and selecting Nathan McKinnon with the number one overall pick. He is without question the rookie of the year. He will win the Calder Trophy. Nobody will compete with him. Um, he well he deserves it, and he is going to be a superstar within the next couple of years. Um, now you just the one thing now you got to worry about is a possible sophomore jinx, um, as many players do go through. But after that, I don't think there's going to be too many worries. Nathan McKinnon's going to be a star. He's going to be an absolute stud. Stud. Um, he's going to be a, a fan favorite for, for many years to come. And he'll be the, uh, the next franchise player as well, next to Matt Duchesne uh, and possibly Gabriel Landeskog as well. Um, but now... Even despite the, all the greatness that happened this season, you still got to think about what's next for your free agents. And the Colorado Avalanche have a couple of names on their unrestricted free agent list that we know probably will not be back. Um, well, one name in particular in goal, uh, John, John Sebastian Jaguer. We pretty much know his career is probably over. He's 39 years of age, I believe. Yeah, or 36 years of age, but his body is aging faster, but his mind is aging faster than his body, and he doesn't have it in him to play anymore. One's got to think that John Sebastian Jaguer is probably going to retire this offseason. Um, he played his last, re what could be his last regular season game um, the other night, the final game of the regular season against his old mates, the Anaheim Ducks, in a 3-2 overtime loss. Um, um, they have already given their trade debt, their one trade deadline acquisition, Rito Berra, a contract extension. He is the next backup goaltender in Colorado um, for the upcoming season. And defenseman Matt Hunwick, um, who has a contract outside of the league, he will not be back. Um, his contract officially runs out this year, which means he'll officially be gone. <laughs> And then on defense, you got Corey Sarich and Tyson and Andre Benoit. Corey Sarich, he was hurt most of the year. Plus, he's 34 years of age. You gotta think he probably won't be back in Colorado because of that. He's a good, solid shutdown defenseman, but he wasn't there for them at all this year. But then they also got Andre Benoit back there. He was 29 years of age. But he was just absolutely surprised everyone in Colorado this year. This is a second year in the NHL. He's an unrestricted free agent, but one's got to believe that Andre Benoit will be re-signed in Colorado. He was absolutely fantastic for them. And then up front, up front, four, as far as their forwards go, oh, only one forward is an unrestricted free agent, and that is Paul Stastny. Now, that, that's really the big free agent for the Colorado Avalanche this year. And that's going to be the big question looming on everyone's mind. Where is Paul Stastny going to go? Is he going to stay with the Colorado Avalanche, or is he going to go elsewhere? Um, he, you know, hasn't been exactly the same player as we've seen the first few years. You know, he was pretty good last year and was monstrous in the playoffs as well. But... I feel like the Avalanche need him, and I'm sure they want to re-sign him, but it's really going to just all come down to him and whether he wants to stay or he wants to go. But he provides them a lot of depth. They have a lot of options at center. Um, losing that depth would be huge, a huge loss for the Avalanche. Um, so I personally, if I were an Avalanche fan, I'd be hoping that he gets signed. Um, and then, you know... They got a couple of unrestricted free agents in their system, um, but no one really important. And then as far as restricted free agents are concerned, this is where they're a little bit bigger as far as their restricted free agents are concerned. Ryan O'Reilly in particular, he's the biggest restricted free agent, but there's been talk looming that he's wanted to leave Colorado for a while. That would be, to me, an even bigger loss than Paul Stastny. He's He's still young, he's 22 years of age, and he's pretty much their Patrice Bergeron, the guy on their team who just does a little bit of everything and can play multiple positions. He has experience at center, and he has experience at wing. 
He played wing all of this past season, not to mention his ability, his proven ability to stay out of the box. Only one penalty all last season, and that was just for playing with a broken stick. So it was unbelievable how he managed to stay out of the box all that much. Um, so if I were the Avalanche, I'd want to re-sign O'Reilly, and I'm sure they want to re-sign him. But now it's all going to come down to O'Reilly. The mi the, the rumor around Colorado is that he's interested in staying now under new head coach Patrick Waugh. He has a good relationship with him. But at the same time, you still got to figure after all that time he spent complaining about be where he was and what his position on the team was, <laughs> that you got to think that he's still a possibility that he could leave um, or be go leave via arbitration. And the same could be said for 24-year-old left winger uh, Jamie McGinn. He's a restricted free agent. But there's been talk of him being an odd man out in Colorado. Um, but he would be a good pickup for anybody. He's a hard worker. He's a very hard worker. And he provides energy. He'll provide energy. He'll do a little bit of everything. Um, so that would be a pretty decent loss, in my opinion, for the Avalanche. Although, that's more them being interested in him, you know, leaving. And then, of course, they have Brad Malone. And Paul Carey, two 24-year-olds, um, in you know their extra forwards. Brad Malone, um, I believe he play he played a lot more down the stretch. Um, so we'll see what happens to him. Obviously, the Canadian cousin of Ryan Malone. Um, so we'll see what happens to him. And then on defense, they have two young. Youngsters on defense, 22-year-old Stefan Elliott and 21-year-old Tyson Berry. Stefan Elliott only, only played one game this whole season after being a regular in their lineup for two straight years, but they still have a lot of faith in him. They think he could be a very good player on their blue line in the near future, and Tyson Berry, already a proven defenseman in their lineup. They sh he showed it this past regular season. He was arguably the best defenseman on the t their team. He was so losing him was huge in the playoffs, and they these two guys restricted free agents. You gotta expect that they'll both be signed by the Avalanche in the off in the the off season, especially especially Tyson Berry. And then as far as the restricted free agents in the minors, only one real significant name, and that's their first-round pick from 2010, Joey Hishin, who played his first NHL game last night in Game 7 and played pretty well. He had an assist in the game. He's battled concussion problems through most of his junior career, but he showed that maybe he's past that and maybe he could play at the NHL level. So I could see the Avalanche maybe re-signing him as a restricted free agent as well and he him becoming a regular in the lineup someday. So, <laughs> so once again, overall, congratulations. Congratulations to the Minnesota Wild on a huge um, seven-game series win. They again move on to the next round to play the Chicago Blackhawks and the Rangers move on to the next round to play the Pittsburgh Penguins. Going to be very, two very interesting series. And now, last but certainly not least, the big series to talk about here. This is the one I've been waiting to talk about for quite a while for very good reason. The San Jose, the Los Angeles Kings and the San Jose Sharks. Game 7 at the SAP Center, the Shark Tank. How about the Los Angeles Kings? A 5-1 to one upset victory at the tank to c complete a 3 nothing ser de series deficit comeback in the first round this year. The Sharks pretty much had it. They had a 3 nothing series lead, and they totally were dominating this series. The Kings come back and win the series in seven. It's unbelievable. Only the fourth time in NHL history it's happened, and only the fifth time in all of sports that it's happened. Again, four of those five times in the NHL, one time. The fifth time was in Major League Baseball, um, the Red Sox coming back against the Yankees, but that's baseball. So back to hockey. Um, 
Um, but the, how about it? The Santa, the Los Angeles Kings, determination and cup experience is what gets it done here. The series overview, again, the Sharks, a 3 nothing series lead. They won their first two games at home. Six to and both in decisive fashion. Six to three and seven to two. The Kings just got absolutely destroyed in both of those games. Game three series shifts to LA. That game goes to overtime. I'm six minutes and twenty seconds into the first overtime. Patrick Marlowe would get his third of the playoffs from Joe Pavelski and Scott Hannon. That would be the overtime winner. The only overtime game of that series. Um, that gave the Sharks a 3-0 series lead. But then the comeback started. Um, with all, The Kings would win game four on home ice to keep stay alive. 6-3 to three victory, similar to the Sharks' victory in game one. 6-3 to three victory on home ice. Then, Game 5, back to the Shark Tank, a place that had just been nightmarish to the Kings over the years. The Kings knew in order to win the series, they'd have to steal not just one, but two games in a building that they've absolutely struggled in in many in recent years. years, Especially last year's playoffs. Again, those two met in last year's playoffs. That series went to seven games. The Kings won that series. The home team won every game in that series. But the Kings... Totally steal one in game number five. Game number five, three nothing vic shutout win for Jonathan Quick and the Kings. <laughs> game six, back to uh, series shifts back to L.A. Alex Stalock gets the start in goal for the Kings over Ante for the Sharks over Anti Niemi. <laughs> Does not prove to be the right decision. Four to one victory for the Kings in game number six. That ties the series remarkably enough. And then Game 7 back to San Jose. The Sharks take a... They go back to Anti Niemi. The Sharks take a 1-0 lead off Matt Irwin's goal just 28 seconds into the game. But after that, it was all L.A. Scoring 5 unanswered, including 2 empty netters. 5-1 to one victory by the Kings in Game 7 at the Shark Tank to complete the comeback. It's just absolutely unbelievable. So, whenever that happens in any sport, again, it doesn't happen much, but it's just something to behold and something to talk about. The San Jose Sharks, they thought they had this series won, and I think, and so did everybody else, um, but everyone said that the Kings were not going to lose in the first round, and that has proven to be the case. The Kings come back, with the, with the determination to play their arch rivals, the Anaheim Ducks, in the second round, the first for the first time ever after the this how with how great this rivalry has been, they've been to Europe, they've been in an outdoor game, but they've never met in the playoffs. They finally will meet in a playoff series. The Ana the Los Angeles Kings will play the Anaheim Ducks in the next round. Um, so why the Kings managed to pull the comeback off? And it went well. It all goes back to their cup experience. This is a team stacked with cup experience, and that includes two of their three healthy scratches: Willie Mitchell and Jordan Nolan. The other one is Jeff Schultz, but he does not have a cup. But then you look at Matt Green, Drew Doughty, Mike Richards, Andre Kopitar, Kyle Clifford, Justin Williams, Trevor Lewis, Dustin Brown, Slava Voinov, Alec Martinez was a part of that cup team. Um. He's a youngster. He was a part of that cup team um, in 2012. <laughs> um, uh, Jared Stoll, um, Dwight King, and Jeff Carter. The only players in the lineup without a cup. Jake Muzzin, I don't believe he got his name engraved on that uh, 2012 team. No, he did not. But <laughs> Jake Muzzin... Marion Gabrick, um, Robin Regeer, Tanner Pearson, and Tyler Toffoli, the only players to never get their names on the cup. And then, of course, the backup goaltender, Martin Jones. But Jonathan Quick, the starter, 
was also part of that 2012 team. He was the Conn Smythe Trophy winner that year. You compare that with the Sharks, uh, with the players on the Sharks. Um, Brad Stewart, he's he's a Cup veteran. He has a Cup on his resume. Rafi Torres has been to the finals a couple times. Um, you know, Dan Boyle, he, of course, had a cup with the Lightning in 2004. But that's pretty much it. And like Antti Niemi, he had a cup with the Hawks in 2010. But that's pretty much it. They do not have anybody other than that. Uh, well, okay, they got Adam Burrish, who was a scratch. Um, you know, he was part of that 2010 Chicago team. Um... Tyler Kennedy, who didn't play <clears throat> by that 9 Pittsburgh team. But that's about it. They re uh, they do not have anybody. Uh, like It's not like the Kings that they're stacked with all that cup experience. The Kings are stacked with cup experience, and they were able to use that as a motivator to come back in the series. <laughs> they know how to play in the playoffs. They just got off to a very rough start, and they had bugs going into the series. Um, once they got that rust out... They just dominated. Um, the Kings were very good on the power play in this series, scoring six times on the power play in 24 attempts. Their power play was a big reason why they won the series. Um, and, you know, their, their, their ability to play defensive-style hockey also was a huge factor as well. And then Jonathan Quick, after those first three games, once he got on his horse, he never got off. Jonathan Quick was brilliant through the final four games. He looked like Jonathan Quick again. Um, and Marion Gabrick, their trade deadline acquisition, coming up huge as well. He came up huge in that series. So that's pretty much why the Kings won. Why the Sharks lost. Again, not very good on the penalty kill or the power play. Um, again, the lack of experience on their team, not as mu nowhere near as many much cup experience as the Kings. And for the Sharks, after they took that <clears throat> three nothing series lead, they got very very cocky. The goaltending did not hold up. Antti Niemi pl had probably his worst playoff series ever in his career. We've ne I've never seen Antti Niemi play this poorly in a playoff series, ever. Um, the goaltending didn't hold up. Alex Stalock wasn't good either in the one game he got, full game he got. Um, and, you know, it was just all confidence was lost by the Sharks players. And then they lost Mark Edward Vlasic for the remainder of the series as well. He suffered an injury. That proved to be probably the biggest loss of all for the Sharks, and that to me may have been the biggest reason why. With Vlasic out of the lineup, that really put a damper on their defensive core. And Vlasic, he's their best shutdown defenseman, their most consistent shutdown defenseman, a Canadian Olympian and gold medalist from last year, along with Patrick Marlowe. Um, so it's rough, you know. It was rough when he went out the way he did. Um, and that was a big reason why they lost. Um, you know, it's kind of it kind of makes you feel bad a little bit. But as a Ducks fan, I'm not really keen on the Sharks, and I wanted the Kings to win this series personally. But at the same time, you know, you still gotta feel bad. You feel you kind of a team. You know, you think they're gonna win, but they end up losing. They end up blowing that series. You know, it's very heartbreaking for the fans in San Jose as well. And for even the guys on the ice, guys like Joe Thornton and Patrick Marlowe, who have been seeking a cup for a very long time and they still haven't won it yet. Um, those guys must be getting frustrated. With that being said, though, it, business is business, and you got to move on to it and look to next season. And the Sharks for next season, <clears throat> they're going to have quite a bit to think about. They already signed Joe Thornton and Patrick Marlowe to three-year contract extensions. But one's got to think now, what's going to happen to the head coach, Todd McClellan? Does he, get, get, does he get fired or is a major trade on the horizon in San Jose? That's something that's going to be looked upon 
but they really don't have any real big, un, you know, free agents up front. Mike Brown, Bracken Kearns, really they're only two unrestricted free agents up front. On defense, they got a couple of bigger um, names. You know, Scott Hannon, who's can still he was 34 years of age, but is still a solid shutdown defenseman. He's a he's an unrestricted free agent, and then. Dan Boyle, 36 years old, but he can still play the game. He's got that big shot from the point. And the Sharks were hoping that they could maybe re-sign Boyle and sign him not to, and to, to a long-term deal. They thought maybe, even though he's 36, that they could bring him back and sign him to like a heavy deal, you know? Because he can still play the game at his age. Um, but he... Wants another cup before he retires. He has one with the Lightning, but he wants another one. And at this point, you got to have your doubts about Dan Boyle coming back to San Jose. Um, they got a lot to think about, the Sharks. I mean, Boyle himself, he's got a lot to think about as well, <clears throat> about where his future is going to lie. And then in the system... You know, John McCarthy, 26-year-old, the only signif decently significant unrestricted free agent, Chad Raw, Rob Davison, the other two. Um, yeah, they really don't have And then you got restricted free agents, James Shepard, Tommy Wingles. You can bet on it that Tommy Wingles is going to be re-signed. He had a big year this year. And then James Shepard, he definitely has not lived up to his draft status, that's for sure. Eighth overall pick from 2006. He definitely has not lived up to his draft status. However, one, you could also get the feeling, you know, the Sharks like him, and he's come up big for them. He came up big for them in the playoffs this year. He was actually one of their better players in the playoffs this year. So that's something that's going to be thought about. And then, of course, Jason Demers, and then 23-year-old Nick Petrecki, one of their top prospects. Nick Petrecki's probably a guy who's going to get signed. They have a lot of high hopes for him. And then Jason Demers, he's solidified a spot on their blue line. Um, he'll definitely be resigned. And then 25-year-old goaltender Alex Stalock, he's a restricted free agent. Um, he was very good as a backup goaltender during the regular season. He definitely will get resigned as well. And then they really don't have any big restricted free agents. in. Well, they have a couple of restricted free agents in their system. Matt Tennyson. Um, Matt Pellick, um, Taylor Doherty, Adam Comrie, uh, J.P. Anderson, Harry Satari. Um, so yeah, a couple of those, couple of names. Um, those are some of the bigger names down there in a farm system that really isn't that deep. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in San Jose for the upcoming season as well. They're going to have a lot to think about. But once again, congratulations to the Los Angeles Kings. They will face, they beat the San Jose Sharks in seven games. They will play the Anaheim Ducks in the next round. So before we cut this video, congratulations to the three Game 7 winners, the New York Rangers, the Minnesota Wild, and the Los Angeles Kings as they beat the Philadelphia Flyers, Colorado Avalanche, and San Jose Sharks respectively in seven games. And the New York Rangers, they will take on the Pittsburgh Penguins, Sidney Crosby and the Pittsburgh Penguins in the next round. The Minnesota Wild will look forward to a rematch with Pat, the likes of Patrick Kane, Jonathan Taves, Patrick Sharp, Marion Hossa, Duncan Keith, and the rest of the Chicago Blackhawks. And, congrat, and the Los Angeles Kings, for the first time ever, will play the likes of Ryan Getzoff, Corey Perry, and the Anaheim Ducks. Ducks that, proves, that will prove to be a very exciting series. We've seen... The Sharks and the Kings go at it a few times, and we've seen the Ducks go at it with the Sharks once. That was in 2009. The Ducks would pull off a huge upset over that year's Presidents Trophy winners in six games. And, but for the first time ever, now we are seeing Ducks-Kings. So it's going to be exciting, and then, of course, we already know, as you already know, the Boston Bruins and the Montreal Canadiens will square off in the next round as well. They actually start off the second round tonight. Um, 
I that's another series that will prove to be um, something spectacular, the greatest rivalry in National Hockey League history. <laughs> so with that being said, that'll do it for episode 120. However, I probably am going to have another video today. Um, I am going to preview the each of the playoff series. Um, I That is something I do have to do. Um, I'm going to tr get it done before the um, Boston-Montreal game tonight for sure, but I probably won't be uploaded until the game had already started. So I'll definitely have it finished before the game starts, but I probably won't have it uploaded before the game starts. We'll see, though. Um, but So this is not the last video today. I will have episode 121 later on today. I just need to rest for a little bit before I get that done. Um, and for in the next video, I will talk about each of the second round playoff series. Um, and since there are only four series, I'll talk about them all in one video. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> that's going to do it for episode 120 of Hockey on the Spot. Thank you all for joining me today. This has been Hockey on the Spot with Brandon Barenfeld. I'm Brandon Barenfeld. I will see you guys again in a, few, in a couple of hours. Thank you and have a great day.